Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Living Room Lecture Series at Historic Locust Grove. Not at Historic Locust Grove, sponsored by Historic Locust Grove. We're all so pleased you're here today. Um, my name is Hannah Zimmerman, and I am the Marketing and Communications Director today, and I will be your Logistical Stage Manager. We're so grateful to you all for being here. We're grateful to John and Jeannie Vizeau for being um, partners and sponsors of this program. And now, if she's ready, I'm going to turn it over to our Executive Director, Carol Ely, to say a few words and welcome you all to our virtual space. Take it away, Carol. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you're all joining us again. This has become now a Locust Grove tradition that I don't think we will want to stop to be able to have these um, virtual experiences where we can have guests from all over. So it's, uh, it's wonderful. Um, many of you may have heard uh, that as of yesterday, the governor has announced a possible beginning opening date for museums of June 8th. So the staff of Locust Grove and Metro Parks, which owns the site, will be conferring about a uh, safe gradual rollout of our services again, starting at some point uh, later in, in June. So uh, stay tuned. We don't have a firm date yet, but stay tuned. And I'm sure that Hannah, who was just speaking to you, who's our marketing director, will let you know through social media, our website, press releases, you know, every other possible way when you can join us in person if you're so inclined. But we do expect to continue to offer virtual experiences for some time in the future as many people will not uh, feel comfortable going out and also because it gives us uh, the availability of a really wide and exciting range of speakers and experiences. So I won't take up any more of your time. Do you want to take it back, Anna? I have to unmute myself to do that. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much, Carol, for that. And now for a brief interlude that is becoming his trademark, Brian Cushing, Locust Grove's Marketing and Communications Director, uh, not Marketing and Communications Director, our Program Director. I'm so used to saying my own job title. Brian Cushing, our Program Director, is going to um, talk to a little bit about uh, cholera cocktails with us. Um, but I don't think that means what I think it means. So Brian, take it away. Well, uh, welcome back everybody uh, this afternoon. Ordinarily uh, when I uh, pop up here, there's alcohol involved. Um, and we talked over some, uh, we had some suggestions for some cocktails that we can try for, for cholera, but it wasn't really clicking. And then we started thinking about remedies a little bit. Uh, and I was gonna make a remedy, but it would mostly been me staying at the stove. So I pulled out a few references. Uh, from the 1850s and 60s here, uh, and just kind of started looking up what they were thinking about uh, as far as cures for cholera. We've got Cooley's Encyclopedia of 6,000 Receipts from 1851, uh, and also there was a Dr. Chase. This is an original from the 1850s, and this is a reprint from 1866. Uh, basically, Dr. Chase published books of recipes for everything, and he collected different people's input um, and you can see that cholera uh, during this period was still something that was, it was on people's minds. He actually went from uh, one cure in the 1850s to eight uh, in 1866. And uh, one of the things you see in Dr. Chase's is that he was collecting basically testimonials from people who had lived through cholera incidents um, all around the world. Uh, actually, and uh, the things that they used that they uh, swore it actually helped. So you see a lot of trial and error uh, going on with uh, with what he's doing, and that's something we talk about in distilling. Sometimes when we're down to distillery, is is sometimes they through one step or another they they determine what they knew could work but didn't necessarily know why it worked in some of these cases maybe terry will tell us it wasn't working at all um but some of the common things that you see in these remedies that you might be plied with either topically or orally uh some more familiar things are castor oil cinnamon cloves brandy rhubarb cayenne ginger and peppermint uh some of the less familiar things that you might have run into were spirits of camphor opium and sometimes specifically uh, the opium was in the form of a laudanum, which is a solution made with alcohol. And uh, if you don't know how to make that, Dr. Chase has uh, some instructions also if you need to learn how to make yourself some laudanum. Uh, aromatic spirits of ammonia and chloroform. 
So those are some of the things that you might expect to encounter uh, on your road to uh, hopefully a cure and survival from opium. And uh, we will put, I think we're, we were talking about, we'll put one of the recipes out from 1866 uh, that is just regular stuff you find around your house. If you're feeling a little bit choleric and you want to give it a try. Uh, so with that, thank you very much for joining us again. And I will toss it back to Hannah. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Um, we are just so excited um, to have Terry with us today. Uh, so Terry, are you ready for your introduction? I'm ready. Okay, everybody, here we go. Terry Foodie, RN, MSN, Certified Clinical Research Coordinator, is a graduate of Niagara University, New York, and the University of Kentucky. She has worked in community health, taught nursing at Kentucky State University, and coordinated research projects for new medicines and treatments at the University of Louisville. She is a member of Sigma Theta Tau, the International Nursing Honor Society. She was a project coordinator of a Lexington Fayette Urban County Government Stormwater Quality Research Grant for Friends of Wolf Run Watershed. And as a speaker and consultant on healthy living, she has offered workshops and private consulting. She's on the Speakers Bureau of Kentucky Humanities Council and is the author of two nonfiction books, including the subject of today's book, the pie, today's talk, The Pie Seller, The Drunk, and The Lady, Heroes of the 1833 Cholera Epidemic in Lexington, Kentucky, Lessons for Our Global Health Today. She has also written the book, The Cherokee and the Newsman, Kinsman in the Words, the story of Sequoia, inventor of the Cherokee alphabet, and his half-nephew, Howard Grafts, editor of the Kentucky Gazette. And we are so pleased to have Car uh, Terry Foodie with us today to speak um, as part of our Living Room Lecture Series. Welcome, Terry. Thank you, Hannah. That was... That was great. I only have one thing to change. I worked at the University of Kentucky, not at University of Louisville. But maybe that's that's maybe that's that was I'm my bad. I uh, I live with the U of L fan and I <laughs> misspoke. So University of Kentucky, go Wildcats. My apologies. Actually, it was the hospital. Okay, let's get a couple things out of the way so that you won't be thinking about this all the time. I'm talking at the beginning part. The accent is the southern tier of New York State, Elmira, New York, which is where my Irish grandparents settled. Foodie is an Irish name. It's Fuda in, in Irish. But I go back on my mother's side, five generations to Bourbon County, and my great-grandfather rode with John Hunt Morgan. So that's all you probably need to know. Now, on this topic, I've been researching it for a couple of decades. I was just curious as a public health nurse to know if nursing was involved or what the story was. I've read everything that's in the bibliography and taken copious notes on it. I know I need a life. And I've also interviewed many people and gone to different sites. I have great respect for the people who try to help these folks and for the people that are working with the COVID patients right now. And I hope to have humility to present the story of those who died. Okay, so here we go. So let's go back to 1833. And it's early summer. It's like June, June 3rd, June 4th or whatever. And you're going to a nice ball tonight. You've got a new scarf that you can use as a wrap and you're really excited about it. And you hope he will be there and that your mother won't be watching you too much. And so you go to the ball and you have a great time. And except that it was raining a lot, but it's been raining for days, you know. And they do say there's some crazy disease in Maysville that's also been on the East Coast, but who cares about that, right? It's spring. But then you get home and, and you're going to bed and, and you, you just don't feel so good. Maybe it was something that I ate at the party or Maybe it was something I ate earlier, but my gosh, I think I'm going to throw up over the side of the bed into the chamber pot. And then I, I have to sit on the chamber pot. And then that's not enough. And I'm, I'm running to the privy in the middle of the night, the necessary, the outhouse. And it gets worse and worse. And I start getting weaker and weaker. And I can't eat anything and I can't stop going to the bathroom. I just can't stop these discharges. 
And then after a while, I become so weak and so out of fluids that I become almost prostrate, just lying, flat. I can't get up. And my eyes start to roll back in my head. My cheeks are sinking in. And my hands become contracted and I have these horrible pains in my arms and my legs and they're all contracted and it's like, oh my God, what's gonna happen if my voice gets really high like this? And I have a, a fishy odor. And, and I can't tell people how bad I feel or what to happens. And within 48 hours, my party garment becomes my shroud. And that's what happened to the people in Lexington in 1833. Let's take a look at this a little bit. Some slides here. Okay, there we go. How are we looking? Hey, Hannah? Yeah. Looks great. Good. So cholera is not a new disease. It's been around for centuries, early reports, and it has taken more people than, than fighting and all that. But, it spreads when people move and wars and occupations got it started early on. This is a disease of the small intestine. It's a gastrointestinal disease. What we're dealing with right now with COVID is respiratory. And one of the reasons that I study these things and went into public health nursing is I'm fascinated by systems, the systems in the bodies and the systems that we live in, in our communities and our world. So when you drink in water that has the color of Vibrio in it, it's going to attack your small intestine and it's not gonna be the same. And you're gonna be losing all this fluid, which is why the person started contracting with the dehydration, losing the electrolytes, and it goes on and on. And we're not just talking, and I hope nobody's eating their lunch right now, but we're not just talking feces coming out with diarrhea, it eventually looked like this rice water discharges and liters of fluid coming out, just soaking the bed clothes. This is a horrible way to die if this anyway is easy because the person knows what's going on right to the end. The pulse becomes gone, the hands are so cold, and the, some of the doctors who checked in and said we went in and I thought we were gonna do an autopsy and the person spoke. They look like they've been dead for three days, but they were still alive. So for a long time, centuries, color was mostly in the India, Bangladesh area over there. They even called it Asiatic cholera, but the British invaded India. And by 1817, the first British person died from cholera in India. And then you have all these travel routes from east to west coming with the, you know, the spices and the rugs and everything else that people wanted. And as people move with travel, trade, war, warring armies moving, they can take cholera with them inside their bodies. It's not contagious from person to person, but it's infectious. So if it comes out of your body through your own feces and gets into water, the Vibrio has no taste, no smell, no odor. But if it contaminates a well, then somebody else is gonna bring it up. You see this person is extremely dehydrated. His eyes are rolled back in its head. This poor man is suffering so much. Those were also called washerwoman hands, which shows some of the gender jobs that people had back then. And the death is from cardiac arrest. Those of you who are medical will understand that from the dehydration. If we don't have the right electrolytes, our heart can't fire. And so this is what really kills us. Did they know that? No, they did not. Cholera decimated St. Petersburg, Russia. Some of the things I read, I will not tell you because they're just too scary. What they would do to people they were suspicious of. And yes, they fought back against it because they didn't want to lose their commerce and their towns. But by 1831, 
towards the end of 31, November, here's this drawing of this girl who was the first victim. And that's a, board, that's a border town. It's a port. So people are getting to the exit of it. She has blue hands, which shows the loss of circulation. She's contracted. And I don't know what else is in this picture, but here's the reaction. All right, we'll go back here. As far as the symptoms go, I mean, I don't know what's going on here, whether they tried to give her tea up at the top or what for the treatment. But the reaction was, blame the doctors. When something happens, it, you got to find that you don't like and you're afraid of, you've got to find a victim. And I want to say this right now. I've been speaking about cholera for about 15 years, and I didn't plan to do that when I did all that research on my own. I was just doing it for myself. But I started in, I think it was December 04, with infectious disease doctors at UK, the, the fellows. And some of these things, I, some of these slides I put together then, they are so much like what's going on now. <laughs> I want you to know I didn't just make them up for this COVID talk. So they, they blamed the doctors. They thought the doctors were just trying to make some money here, sell some drugs, you know, get some patients. But six weeks later, the cemetery is full. And they even put this notice up saying, if you're going to die from cholera, you can't be buried here. So that's how quickly it had changed from what they wanted to believe and what was actually there. <laughs> Now, what did they think cholera was? Well, they thought it was this miasma, which was a term I wasn't familiar with until I started looking at this, but it means bad air, swamps, uh, rotting things, rotting refuge, vegetables, whatever. Remember, they didn't have garbage pickup back then, so things got thrown out in the cities, and they thought it was the bad air, or, or poverty, or intemperance, poor diet health, immorality, filth, you know, the usual crime, the usual suspects. And I hate to say this, but I'm going to be very frank in this talk, that some of the writings was, it's where the free slaves are living in their shacks. It's their fault. You know. So the prejudice has started pretty early, and you'll find it in some of the writings. Lexington at that time was considered the Athens, 8th Athens, as you would say from Greece, of the West. They thought it had this healthful reputation. Transylvania Medical College was there. I'm going to stop right there. Before I wrote the book, I went back and wanted to get my scenes together, and I didn't know I was going to write a book. But, so I read all the trustees notes from 1780 to 1834, 36, and then they, they lost some of them. They were trying very hard to become a city. They had town trustees. They didn't have a city council. They became a city the year before cholera hit in 32. So they did have this helpful reputation. The doctors were at the medical college. The town was situated on the Alcorn Stream, the town branch fork of it. The water was from wells, springs, public pumps. Now here's the thing. They had very shallow privies cars, caverns, underground, and sinkholes. Probably most of you know this, but those of you who don't live in Kentucky, karst is a porous limestone underground that has caverns, horizontal caverns. So picture this, you've got a privy that could be less than two feet deep, and you're on a, on a waterway. A lot of rain, privy's going to overflow. You're going to have some of those contents, this is going to get gross, spilling out into the yard. You've got sinkholes, porous ground, goes down into these horizontal caverns, connects to a shallow, uh, a shallow pump for a well. And there were many public pumps downtown and around the houses, not just within the houses. So people could get their water from different sources. And yes, there was a lot of rain and it was overflowing. Okay, so this wasn't the only, oh, Here's a picture of the town branch. Here's a picture of the town. This is the Karst map. This is a famous map that was probably drawn around 1835. This was a rendition of it that was published in the Lexington paper around 1900. Here at 27 was the common graveyard. It wasn't out there. It was right here. If you know the city, 
this is across from Rupp Arena, that gray Gothic looking church that's on the other side of the street up on the hill. This was, this is where their parking lot is right now. That's where the main graveyard was. And there was a new Episcopal graveyard more in this area up here. Okay, now number of victims. This is actually higher than what you have here. The population in Lexington was almost 7,000. The total number of deaths turned out to be 502, which is 8% of the population. You'll notice that just like today, New Orleans, New York, really high numbers with New York City. Louisville was not hit as hard as Lexington percentage wise, but they did lose Eliza Cron Hancock at Locust Grove. She was in her early 30s. She was only about 33 years old. She had been having some other digestive problems that spring, but she did succumb to cholera. And Hannah has that in letters someplace on the Locust Grove site. So he said to me, what happened, what was with Somerset? Somerset was on a river then, it wasn't on a lake. So the, th the story, the theory goes that it came across the ocean, it wasn't my asthma, it was in somebody's body. It came across the ocean from these ports, especially Louisiana, came up the Ohio to Maysville and came from Maysville to Lexington. How, you ask me, did that happen? They're trying to make it into a city, right? In the, in the 1820s, they built a macadamized road from Lexington to Maysville. They also got railroad. This is stuff, some of the things that Benjamin Gratz was involved in. They got a railroad, you know, went to Midway, went to Frankfort. So they got a railroad, they got a macadamized road. People in Maysville got the cholera. Within five days later, on June 2nd, the first case was at Pastor White's Tavern down in Lexington. I think they jumped on the stagecoach and came on down to Lexington. Disease spreads with people's movement. All right, so what do the doctors think? Well, there was disagreement. Ideology means what's the cause? That was, I got that ready for the doctors. Okay, what is the cause of it? There was disagreement among the physicians. Some of them thought it was a poison in the nervous system, eh? circulatory congestion, eh? contagious, uh -uh. led to quarantines though. Ships in harbor, examining travelers at ports, spraying them with liquids and fumes before they would let them in, especially immigrants. The microscope wasn't invented until the 1880s. And then they found the Vibrio cholerae. I'm not saying he was the first person to suggest that that was the cause of it, but we didn't have any proof till then. So that's 50 years later. What are we gonna know 50 years from now about COVID that we don't know today? I won't be alive to know the answer to that, but when you don't know exactly what it is, you have different ways of approaching it. What was the response? Okay, first of all, there was denial. Denial is the hallmark pattern of all these diseases that affect the world. And why? Because it's expensive. It, it affects the commerce of the country, the tourism, the trade, the farmers can't get their crops to market, and nobody wants to have a dirty city. Nobody wants to have a dirty country. So they'll, they'll ignore it until they can't ignore it anymore. Flee to the countryside, get away from the miasma. In Lexington, they went to the Keene Hotel, if they had the money, which a lot of them did. They went to the Keene Hotel, and tried to get refuge there. They went to Olympia Springs, tried to get refuge there. They probably took it with them. There was no hospital except for the lunatic asylum. And I use that word because that's the term they used, a sanctuary for people with mental problems. I'm sure some of you feel like you could use that right now during this. For care and also for isolation, there was no hospital for care or isolation. In New York City, 
Well, maybe I'll, I'll finish with Lexington, they'll say something about New York. Okay, they thought about starting up a board of health and it is in those trustees notes, but it hit them so hard that that never happened. So you have no central place for surveillance or sanitary enforcements or to know how to track who's got it, who doesn't have it. The physicians were sick, three died, one was out of town and never came back until the collar was over. Another was running down the steps to answer a call. He got a bell at the front of his house. He's running down the steps to answer the call, fell and broke his arm. I think he still tried to work. The treatment was by anecdote versus data. And that means each person writes their own story of how people respond. Brian brought some of that out. This is what worked for me. This is what worked for me. But you don't have the data to compare to see who really responded, who didn't. And you can't control the data to uh, look at factors that may influence it, too. What's my next slide? All right. In New York City, they did open a hospital in Grand Ridge Village. And that's in one of uh, the bibliographies about what they did in Grand Ridge Village, that the doctors were putting out a newsletter like every other week to tell people what to do. But they had problems with it because they still weren't taking the disease seriously. Some of the things that people would say was, oh, let's, let's go to the cholera hospital after we go to the opera so we can look at the patients. You know, it was something to do. And then somebody else wrote and said, what is this hospital supposed to be for? There's drunks in here sleeping it off. And some of the medical students of the time were coming in there and it was almost like a party to see how everybody was. So even with all these handicaps, they were still able to get some of these people treated and get them away from fouling up other water sources. Now you look at Lunsford Hero quite a bit about the cholera afterwards and a few things while it was going on you say well he's an old man well look when he was born he was a young man when cholera was hitting the, the town he was only in his 20s and some of these doctors were inexperienced and they had never seen this before because it had never been in the country before so they didn't know what they were handling situation like we have now all right i put the book together in 14, I didn't plan to write a book. I was pressured by the Dean of Nursing at my college and Niagara University and some other people to do it with the work. I focused, thought I was gonna write just about the cholera, but I focused on these three persons because what often happens is the cooperative efforts of common people can make a big difference. And the pie seller was a freed black woman. She'd been a slave which she was selling to the folks downtown. And, and I also think that when some of these people left town, they left their slaves in town. Their slaves that weren't just in the houses, they were also working at the factories. They had their own homes. I think that Aunt Charlotte helped to feed some of them. Solomon was a businessman who fell to drink and became the town drunk and he was homeless by 1832, they passed a vagrancy charge, a vagrancy law when they became a city and they arrested him the next year for drinking. Auctioned him off as an indentured servant to make money. Aunt Charlotte bought him. Yes, you heard that right. The black woman owned the white man in 1830 Kentucky and he buried the dead of his own accord. He never got paid and he buried hundreds of people. There's a monument to him now for his grave. There was nothing until 1908, 50 years after he died. Maria Grants of Grants Park, daughter of Nathaniel Gist, was married to Benjamin Grants from Philadelphia. And the five children came to her home her mother had died from the cholera. She lost several of her servants, five, seven in the home, but five children from a family called White, the White children, who knew Benjamin Grace came to her home and said that their parents were dead in the house and they were very hungry. And she realized that something needed to be done. So she did something that hadn't been done before. She reached across the aisle and got 
church women from different denominations organized together and said, we're going to start an orphanage and we're going to raise money and this is the way we're going to do it. So in the middle of this great catastrophe with 500 deaths, they managed to raise money and buy a home for an orphanage. It was the first public education because they hired a teacher. It was the first organized thing of charity for vulnerable people that had been done in the town. And that organization still exists today because one of them said, the treasurer should be a widow or a spinster so our husband can't get it, her husband can't get at our money. And they stayed solvent all these years. This is her husband, Benjamin Gratz, who helped the, the council at the city agree to do this, sponsor this, get behind it, help to raise the funds, buy this nice house, they bought a cow, they took care of the kids. Now, what happened after the epidemic? Well, Lexington lost its prominence. It was shown to be fallible. The medical college ended by the Civil War, 30 years later, colleges were in Louisville and Cincinnati. That's where the medical college were. But, and this is for the person in the chat room, Kathy Hall, who asked, and Kathy, that's neat that your ancestors had something to do with, help build the Keene Hotel. There was another round of cholera in 1849. They saw it coming, there weren't as many deaths from it, but they passed some laws to try to make things better. This privy law, they said each privy has to be two to four feet deep. It has to be bricked or, or wooden. I thought, how small were they before? And then the pig law, which says the pigs can no longer run the streets free. You've got to pen them up. There was actually some pushback to that because some people said, yeah, but the pigs eat the garbage, which lets you know that people just threw the garbage in the street. So, but the, the societal concern for a care for vulnerable, not only with the orphanage, but a few other things where they tried to give some money to people that were needing it. This is, I don't know, can you all see this? Okay, because there's some other things on my screen. Maybe you're just seeing this. Deathless from 1849. I wanted to make a comment on society and the way things were back then. I did find this paper in the library. As you notice, the deaths were reported for both of the epidemics by wards. The city was divided into four wards and then the lunatic asylum, which is down to the lower right. You'll notice that there were people from different counties and also Alabama, from other states. Now in the whites, in the deaths were separated by whites and Negroes, the children are named by their parents. If you look at the Negroes, they just say who the owner was woman of Ned Williams, woman of Mrs. Dwyer, woman of Espine, woman of so-and-so. A few of them have their names. Up here at the top is the child at the Phoenix Hotel and Sarah at the City Poorhouse. And I made her become one person, a girl named Sarah working at the Phoenix Hotel. And I gave her a job because I was so touched that a child, a Negro child that didn't even have a name was working at the Phoenix Hotel or whatever was going on then. So this reflects where the society was at that time and how they were counted. All right, so what happened with cholera? John Snow was an anesthesiologist in England and he experimented with ether. I'll have to tell Brian more about that later. He experimented on himself too. But he was determined to figure this thing out and he became a true epidemiologist and looked for the data. They had a big color epidemic in 1854 with many deaths in this area. And what he did, and you've heard it from the Broad Street pump, he removed the pump handle of this one well because of, there were so many cases in this area. But he checked all these deaths and he found out that these people, even though they lived far away, would get their water from the Broad Street because they liked that better. So he came up with a theory that it's in the water and we need to do something about it. And these people here are just throwing their, um, what they get for their babies and everything else, you know, throwing their excrement in the, the common drinking water. So he brought that theory out. Did everybody accept it? No, they didn't. Part of it was business and environment. The water companies, there was two different sets of them and two different sets of 
uh, sewer companies and they were interchanging with some of the pipes. And he had this, this map is in his book also, but there was pushback on that because of the financial part. They didn't accept it right away. And he died when he was 49. So he didn't get to see any of this happen. But bringing the system into cities, like it is in our body of bringing in clean water and taking refuge out of our body with sewers and water makes a difference and bringing the end to cholera. In Lexington, the water pipes came in in 1885. It wasn't for clean water, it was for fire prevention, and people didn't want to pay the tax, so there was pushback on that. And then the sewer treatment plant was in 1919, just had 100 years for that. So not all of that has been recent. And up until the 1970s, I think there were still some outhouses in Northern Lexington. It still had flooding until you have sanitary sewers. So flooding in basements, da da da. Now, town branch is running underneath the city. Everything's fine, right? Cholera's gone from the world? No, cholera's not gone from the world. And we can't touch that easily every vulnerable person. The same way if we're gonna to try to vaccinate people now and do time of testing, we still have homeless people, we still have vulnerable people, and that affects everybody else too. I think some of these places have been cleaned up, but we still have people that don't stay in shelters every night. Where am I with this? Repetitive patterns. I think we're doing, are we doing okay with the time, Hannah? I think we're doing all right, yeah. Doing great. Yep, yeah, this is where I wanted to be at this moment. All right, what did I see, the person who likes the systems? As I said, disease is spread by human mobility, travel, trade, military, invasion, pilgrimages, pilgrimages. Uh, people go to Mecca, people go to Hindu things, Muslim things that they have to do back then. There weren't any places for them to stay, so they camp out someplace. They didn't have porta potties, you know, like we do at our, our, our music festivals or cross country races. They had whatever they could find, dig a hole in the ground, who knows. So then you can get it when you drink out of the stream that somebody might have just used your imagination, okay? The other thing I want to say about this quickly is because I said that this talk would bring in things about COVID. When I saw that they were, they locked down Wuhan. Okay, so they locked down Wuhan. And we complained about how we were, they nailed their doors shut. They couldn't get out. They really quarantined them. They locked down that city. And we complained because we could get out. You know. At the same time, we were airlifting Americans and French and all these other stuff out of there. And I'm going, oh my God, they're gonna bring it here. They can stay there till it's over. I, I hope none of these are your families. But that was my first reaction after my study of cholera. I thought, it's not gonna be contained. You can't bring everybody out when it, when it happens, but human mobility, that's, that's for me. I didn't say it. Denial based on money, commerce, tourism, politics. Here we go. Miss, fears, and false information. I wrote that one a couple days ago. Hinder personal cooperation. I found some of this very much so on CDC and World and Who's website when I was looking at cholera in the modern times. So this was probably 10 years ago. They were saying that when they did their work on AIDS, they found that the myths and the fears was such a hindrance to getting people to even want to be tested for AIDS or to try to have the treatment or talk about their contacts or, or any of that. And the community's like, no, we don't have any of that here. And if we do, we would, you know, run them out of town. So it, it can really hinder personal cooperation. And these are the patterns that continue with the newer diseases. Now, this is exciting news. Oops. I'm sorry, I don't know what I just did. Okay, this is exciting news, maybe for you now, but when I found this in my research 20 years ago, maybe longer than that, I was like, wow, why don't we talk about this? So what happened during these cholera epidemics that would go over and over again, 1833, and then another one in 1875, was Finally, the cities were getting tired of this. They didn't like the ship's quarantine, that sort of thing. So they said, let's get together. Some of the ones, you know, in the Near East, some of the countries in Europe, and we'll talk about 
what are you doing about quarantine where you are? How's it working? What are you doing there? What are you doing here? And we'll start reporting to each other when we have outbreaks so we can prepare. And that was the Sanitary Conference in 1851 in Paris. First collaborative effort to look at the whole world and the health of the whole world at their time and do something together about it. There have been 14 of these sanitary conferences over the last hundred years. And they were here and they were there and more and more people got in it and more and more countries got in it and it evolved to the World Health Organization. In 1948, established by the United Nations, from the framework and the same groups as the Sanitary Conference. So the World Health Organization is 150 years old, as even older than that, almost 200 years old, if you take it back, well, 180 years old, to the Sanitary Conference. And it also shows that this idea of having a collaborative worldwide effort when you have big pandemics like this is not new. And it is a practice that's been going on and has been very effective with cholera. Who has, who has authority now to go into a country that's in the middle of denial and all that other stuff and set up testing and treatment and care for cholera outbreaks? And I'll show you on another slide what they find is so much of the grassroots response is what makes that work. We have emergence of these old diseases. 100,000 people a year still die from cholera in the world. Why does that happen? Unrest, war, huge refugee camps, migrants, and people are just collateral of these things. Tuberculosis has researched also, and then the new ones, SARS, Ebola, and COVID. Diseases that happen with changes, This animal to human jump, environmental changes, things of deforestation, and, and, and war. Okay, now, something else. CEDO, I remember learning this in school, some of you might not. Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. I looked it up last night because I wasn't sure. Started, started by President Eisenhower and Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, UK, United Kingdom, and France got in on it too with some of these other countries. And at first it was like to restrict communism, but it hit a big branch of funding research. Why this was important was military officers were deployed to these places, Dhaka, East Pakistan, Egypt, and, the, and their officer said, I want to make it safe for our troops. I don't want them dying from cholera. So they funded these labs. And these labs looked at ways to do intravenous that would be effective. You can't just give saline or, or sugar water. You've got to have the right electrolytes. So you're going to blow out the lungs. And because people had tried this in the 1850s and it didn't work. The papers got better for a while, but then they went ahead and died anyway. But once they got the right electrolytes, they could get the IV formula just right. They worked on an oral rehydration treatment that would work. They worked on vaccines that would give some herd immunity from year to year. From, and a lot of that was from this CETO, which was bringing together governments, countries, military, scientists, and doctors. And that evolved also to this one at Bangladesh, the diarrhea research, and Dr. Sack from Johns Hopkins and his brother David were instrumental in this. Dr. Sack said, I think they just need to have a really strong chicken noodle soup with this other stuff into it to give them enough of the food and electrolytes till we can get something else in them. Miracle of my life, I met Dr. Sack. I met him at a turkey dinner at Chautauqua Institution and his wife, Joe. And he talked to me about what it was like working on the research and the people there and how much these countries are backing them for their folks. So these are the efforts where Americans have worked with other countries. Okay, so is it, we're almost done. These are a little morbid. Um, 
but this is modern day and I want to make sure I make all my points. Okay, years ago, we go back to this one. What were they treating it for, Brian? What did they use to treat them? The things that Brian brought up were treating those symptoms. The laudanum, the opium was for the contractions, these painful contractions to get them to relax. They gave them the cayenne peppers and those rhubarbs and mustards were to try to get this poison off the stomach. So in other words, they're trying to get them to, to vomit, but that just makes them more dehydrated. They also gave them calomel. And Dr. Lunsford Yandel wrote about calomel quite a bit and, and gave all the details of the different dosages. Calomel is mercury. And the calomel dose was increased as the symptoms persisted. Oh my God. You know, so they gave him mercury, which was a purgative. So all this was really making it worse. It, it shows how important it is to keep the data. Like if these, any of these experimental drugs we're looking at right now or the vaccine that we're looking at now, keep the data, watch for the side effects, see how much it really makes a difference or not. Okay, I want to say that about the Calma. I didn't want to lose out on that. Let's see about Cedo. Yeah. War. What happens in war is two things. What happens in war is people, people suffer that are not involved in the war itself. We bombed Baghdad, the U.S., and they had had some cholera here and there, you know, whatever. But we blew up the streets and we blew up their sanitary infrastructure and their water structure. Their government did not respond immediately to fix that up because in the middle of war, you don't put money into city structure, you put it into arms. And the war effort, cholera broke out. This is a picture from the Herald Leader that I took out. Here's this poor woman, here's her name, oh, resting in there and how much that had shown up with the cholera epidemic, or I would say it was an epidemic yet, but it was an outbreak. So this is one of the things where I said war can make it happen also. This breaks my heart. It also makes me angry. Zimbabwe was a mess and the president was denying. They already had military problems. They had reduced the number of hospitals. He said, we don't need hospitals. We're not gonna have a big problem with cholera. On and on and on. Who doesn't need to come here? Doctors Without Borders don't need to come here. We don't need more hospitals. Well, by the time they finally let WHO in and Doctors Without Borders, they had all these deaths, all these sick people, and that it didn't have the hospitals to put the patients in. If you wait too long, if you deny you've got a problem, if you try to use other things, you will have more illness and more patients than you have facilities for. This is not a hospital. This child is on a bench someplace, and where's my pointer, Hannah? Look at this on the floor. You know what? The, you you know what this is? They have boots on. There's a broom over there. Okay, so there's an ivy. There's a blanket. This may be the chart. I hope that's not somebody's coffee. Maybe this is the drink. They. This child is alone. This child was probably brought there by parents who couldn't stay because they had other children and work or whatever back home. They're just charging from their body right through the slats on this bench. I mean, this is what you end up with when the government stays in denial and they don't have the, th don't get me started. <laughs> The nurse of me comes out. I just look at it and I said, this is terrible. Plus, there's, this is not the way to make sure that nobody else is, gets this spreading around. All right. Now, that's enough for me, right, with that one. We didn't think we'd, I took this slide out years ago because people couldn't relate to SARS anymore. Now it's back. Sudden acute respiratory syndrome outbreak in 2003. It took a while for the government to admit they had cases and deaths in February. They didn't let who win until April. 
there were some other things that went with it, but, but it was contained. And it wasn't as contagious as the COVID we had now, so they didn't have as many deaths. But it was a real mo monetary thing because the spread went from China to Hong Kong to Toronto. We stopped with Germany in the middle. Some of the first person, I don't know if you've ever been to Toronto, but because I went to college on the Niagara border, when I went there when I was in school for a weekend, it was like banks on every corner. You know, it's a real, real merchant place. The other thing I want to say about this, and it was the same with Ebola, and you saw how about three of those doctors in the 1883-33 epidemic died from the cholera. The first people to die were healthcare workers. Same with Ebola. Same with cholera. You know, those doctors got cholera too. The reason it is this way is because they don't know what they have. They don't know what they're dealing with. And I would just like to take a moment for, to dedicate my talk to all the healthcare workers and people that are working with COVID patients who have died in this epidemic. In addition to all the patients who've lost their lives and people who sacrifice to take care of folks before they even know how to protect themselves or when they don't even have enough equipment to protect themselves. So we have to learn from these. And while we're still in the middle of one, we can learn from what's happened with other epidemics and try our best for this. I hope you're seeing how much people have had to cooperate with this. Remember how we reacted to this photo? Because this was a big photo. It's like, some people are like, this is really over the top. Maybe those kids would do this. Right now we would say, get those kids apart. Okay, so here's, here's some of the lessons. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to say right now. I, I know that early on with cholera, they have recommended before it even got to Lexington to have a bland diet, avoid fatigue in the night air, increase the doses of calomel if you could get it. People resisted with the doctors and they weren't always really kind to people who had it. I, I think I was telling Brian that some of the cases that I read about in Europe, this poor guy was walking home from someplace to another, he lived in another town and he died on the road. And when they found him, the townspeople and realized that he died from cholera, they burned his house. This one home burned his house because they thought it's probably in his house too. You know? So now at least we have a little bit less fanaticism, or do we? So international authority with local community in prevention, surveillance, and treatment. If people cooperate common people cooperating, grassroots level, coming up with things. I'm thinking about all these people making masks and setting up feeding stations and working out to do things like that, you know, working together to do things like that. It can really make a difference in prevention, surveillance, and treatment. We're all going to be asked to take the vaccine if we can. Maybe people take more flu shots this year. Who knows? In the fall. But all right, if we don't have the international authority, at least our state authority in our, our city or wherever we live, we've realized now how important these, these parts of, to our whole system of life are, our community and our community leaders and all the government services that we need. The other thing that needed to come out and came over again and again was this thing about transparency in media and the government. There was a big outbreak in the 1990s of cholera and they just didn't want to admit it at all. And there was such misinformation from the government because they lost billions in tourism. But if the government is transparent with the media and people get the right information, it can reduce the myths the fears, the false information that was on one of those previous slides, and then you get more cooperation. I'm gonna say this, 
even though I'm not getting the question, but I got, when I talked about cholera in Chautauqua, when I launched my book in 2014, the Ebola pandemic was, the Ebola pandemic, the Ebola outbreak was raging. And I got a question about vaccines. You know, how did I feel about vaccines? And I said, I'm a public health nurse. I have run, well, child clinics. I have vaccinated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children. I haven't had any problems. But for me personally, in the polio epidemics in the 1950s, a family member was hospitalized with that in my own personal family. And when we kids came along, we got the shots, the sugar cubes, the drops. It can make a big difference. Personal cooperation affects a pandemic. People can make individual decisions on uh, their weight or you know, what they eat or what they wear or any of that. But when you make a decision that affects the whole community, that has to be weighed into it. Personal cooperation can affect a pandemic whether it outbreaks or whether it gets under control. So these are lessons that I have seen all the way through and where you live with the environment, as I was saying about the water and the sewers and stuff, where you live and who's in charge has a big influence on whether you survive or die. And I wrote, it can happen here, it can happen to me. I wrote that 15 years ago and here it is. Um, our environment, our world can be dangerous. It can bring death, destruction, frustration, fear, what's gonna happen next, or, and antagonism between, amongst each other. Or we can see that it brings us all together. It's, our world is the sustenance of our life, whether it's the water or the air we're breathing, it's the sustenance of our life and our community, and our whole population. And as we see that our, our waters are all connected, our air is all connected, and we are, and we go at it that way, then we have a better chance of success. So, that's it. I thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. That was really Wonderful. Um, just so much to think about. Um, so many lessons for our public health today, as you said. Um, are you ready for some questions? I am. I just wanted to mention Richie Wireman's photos. He took the pictures of the town branch, the town of Lexington, the homeless person's camp. He, he went into the Bully Bullock House and took a picture of Solomon's portrait. So I thank him for that. He did it for a contest, but he, he lets me use his slides. Thank you to our Wireman. Um, just a reminder, everyone, um, to type your questions in the chat. I will be reading them on your behalf to Terry. Um, first up is Ronnie Drysdale, who was last uh, our last Living Room Lecture spe speaker, who has this question. Do you know if Dr. Alicia Warfield was involved in helping the Lexington response to the epidemic? Alicia Warfield. I don't remember seeing that name, but I'll look for it. Yeah, is he, I don't know which, which ones he's talking about, Alicia Warfield. And the Warfield's name is familiar. Okay, uh, we'll stay tuned, Ronnie. We'll get you an answer to that question. I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> um, we do um, have some people with some questions about our current public health um, situation. Um, yeah. Kugler would like to know, based on your knowledge of former ep epidemics, what are your recommendations concerning COVID-19. Okay, well, I think you've been hearing this. I'll tell you, William, I'll tell you one thing is that for 15 years, I've been sneezing in my sleep. I stopped sneezing in my hands 15 years ago when I got a hold of this uh, DVD that says, why don't we do it in our sleep? So I quit doing that. I stopped touching my eyes about 10 years ago. For the last three flu seasons, I have not touched hands. <laughs> I get a lot of pushback for that. I get criticized. I get, what's wrong? Do you think I got cooties? So I would say, do those things and don't stop doing them. I would also say, 
continue the social distancing, wearing the mask, whatever they tell you to do for as long as we see what's going on with that, go along with the public health authorities. But um, use your own common sense for where you think you should be doing. Get outside, keep your exercise up, eat well, sleep well. Don't expose yourself to any place you don't need to. Don't touch anybody you don't need to. And protect yourself till we know more about this. Okay. Okay, that's what we're hearing from pretty much everyone. And now we've heard it from Terry too. <laughs> Um, yeah. Say, so, are my hands clean? Okay, but otherwise, yeah. <laughs> I've worn contacts in days. Um, the um, another yeah. question is sometimes with epidemics and pandemics and outbreaks of disease, we see different cycles. So um, we do have Caitlin asking, do you have any thoughts on a potential surge uh, later this year? Now that we're kind of, uh, we seem to be in a lull, or not exactly in a lull, but we seem to be calming down. Uh, plateauing? Are there ways to prevent yeah. surges historically? I see that her question, <coughs> sorry I'm doing this, I know I, maybe I talked too loud before, but oh. Um, You're fine. We should all, hi everyone hydrate. <laughs> yeah, everybody hydrate. And I run as soon as I get out of bed and I sometimes get that stuff early. I'm, I'm running like three times a day. I'm just going out and doing a mile and a half and a half mile and three miles or whatever. So what are my thoughts? I get the flu shot next year for sure. I would definitely get the flu shot. If you're afraid of reactions or something, take an aspirin as soon as you get in the car, eat as soon as you get home, you know, so, so you won't get a fever from it, but get the shot as soon as they come out with it. I would also continue some of these things. I'd keep a mask in the car for certain places if, you, if we stop wearing masks. I would think twice about some of the places I wanted to go. And if you feel like you're suffering, say, okay, it's going to be a year. It's going to be two years. Can I spend a year or two of my life acting a little bit differently? Get yourself in as best health as you can this summer. The other thing about the fall and winter is try not to get a cold just, just for starters. I'm going to sound like these old fashioned doctors. If your feet get wet, change your socks, change your shoes that sort of thing. But stay away from people that are, that are sick. And if you want to be careful, stop touching hands once fall comes. I think that that's the only thing we know right now, Caitlin. I think more things will be revealed to us during the summer. More data will come out. More things will be understood. But try to take it from the experts those of you with small children, and here I am scratching my face, but my hands are clean. <laughs> I didn't touch my eye. Uh, those of you with small children, I would be even more strict. Yeah. Okay, your kid's got a runny nose. I'm sorry, we're not coming in the house. I'll see you next week. Put the baby back in the car. <laughs> you know. That's another thing. If you want to rub your eyes because they're itching like crazy, just pull on it. It'll quit itching. Go on. Well, if, are there any other questions? This is the final call for questions. You were so thorough in your talk, we didn't have a ton of questions. Okay, um, uh, we want me to answer Kathy Hall's there about the vaccine for the flu. Oh, um, if you if you'd like, I didn't. Oh, I just now saw that one. Excuse me, everyone. Uh, go ahead, Terry. All right, Kathy. Let me. I understand that. I do. I understand that. And I had my big awakening as far as my hands, not my hands, but touching other people's hands. When a friend of mine died from the flu in 18, we had that really bad flu that year and she was like 20 years younger than me. And I thought, wow, yeah, that's it. I'm not touching anybody. The other, the thing is that, yes, you might still get the flu, but if you get the vaccine every year, some of the recommendation is people die from the flu because they might have heart problems, you know, they get pneumonia. This way, you're building it up each year. They want people to get those, these cholera shots for the vaccine, even though it doesn't protect them every year. It just lessens the symptoms for them. They have, it doesn't last as long. They don't have as severe a case. You, uh, even when they've had the vaccine. Yeah, true, some do. 
but we're getting closer and closer to getting a flu vaccine that will be more encompassing for all of them. And I think some of the research that we do with COVID will help us with flu. Go ahead and get the shot. Take an aspirin if it bothers you afterwards. Thank you so much, Terry. <laughs> this was a great, so much great information, both current and historical. And um, I'm going to go ahead and um, turn things back over briefly to our executive director, Carol Ely. If she is there, Carol, are you there? I am. I'm here. There you are. Uh, yes, hi. Final words before we close our lecture. Myself. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, thank you so much, Terry. That was that was great and. Everything you say just makes me grateful for scientists, for healthcare workers, for epidemiologists. Dr. John Snow should be way more famous than he is, although I know the story. It's um, remarkable what we can learn when we're able to dig down into the, the data. And um, I hope that that's what happens with this disease. And thank you for helping eliminate it. Me too. Well, everyone, this concludes our living room lecture series for the day. We um, are so pleased you joined us, and we will be able um, to send out a recording of this lecture. Please, um, please um, sign up for our mailing list if you have not already, and we'll send out an email um, a little bit later today to offer if you have any feedback on your lecture experience. We would love to hear how we can make this experience um, better going forward. Um, and stay tuned for our next living room lecture speaker. Um, our next living room lecture speaker will be announced via email um, as soon as we have that information. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Terry, for being with us. Um, thank you, Brian, for keeping us informed on 19th century medicines as we learn so much um, right now. And until next time from my dining room, I'll see you later. Bye, everyone. Bye.